Warning, this video does contain a massive spoilers for Danganronpa 1, 2, and V3, so please exit out of the video now if you do not wish to be spoiled. Thanks guys! Hey guys, Libby News here. So today I am finally going to start making analysis slash opinion videos regarding V3. To start off with these videos, the first thing I really wanted to discuss was the ending, since as we all know by now, it is a very controversial one. Some really love it and some really despise it. And as a lot of you guys know, right after beating the game, I was very unsure as to how to feel about it and felt that I needed to make a video like this to really establish my own solid opinions regarding it, since I really enjoy analyzing things and thinking on things before forming a full opinion on them. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'm not too rusty at making these. The first thing I want to start out with is that although I've seen so much debate about what the ending means and what Kadaka and Team Dinerampo were trying to portray with the ending, he actually says flat out several times what he and the rest of the team were trying to accomplish either through social media or through interviews. So this video's main focus will be a breakdown of all of the themes as explained by the man himself, along with my own opinions on the ending and whether or not I felt they were successful in accomplishing their goal. First, I'd like to start with explaining how the main theme was portrayed in the epilogue, since I felt it was pretty straightforward and connects heavily to many of Kadaka's comments regarding his direction with the sixth trial. Of course, as we all know, Smoogi tells the remaining students that not only are all the events that took place in Dangrafo 1 and 2 and so on fake, but that all of their memories they have and their talents are fiction as well. In order to overcome this, Saihara mentions that although the events that took place were fiction or lies, they still have the power to move reality. He emphasizes that even if his persona was fake, the pain he and his classmates felt was real. He goes on stating that some lies can lead the world to hope, and some truths can lead the world to despair. He's expressing that both can lead to hope and despair, and that both hold equal power and should therefore be appreciated in the same light. I respect this ending for sharing this theme because it's not one that I see often portrayed, but it's something that I personally relate to and feel should be brought up more often in media. Obviously, running this channel, you can see that fiction has played a huge part in my life, but even before this, I would always play video games or watch anime, read fan fictions or theories, analyze characters, etc. in my darkest, most depressed times as a way to help get me out of it. My investment in fictional media has been able to carry me out of a lot of dark places because of that and has given me a lot of opportunities that I would have never imagined before. So for me personally, this theme really resonates with me because fictional works has affected my reality so much. I also really love the visual representation at the end of V3, where you can see the literal fourth wall decorated in Team Dangrapa logos. This I feel like is the literal image of them transcending past fiction, aka the fourth wall, into reality. In a literal sense within the context of their world, which is of course them leaving this fictional setting Monokuma placed them in, and now going out to face the truth within their reality, but figuratively, I think it also represents how now that this story has ended for us, the people playing the game, these characters can now go on to live past the fourth wall and enter into our reality. Whether that be through analysis or fan fiction or art or just keeping their ideals in mind as you go about your daily life. Essentially, now that you've seen their fictional journey, the impact that they left will now become a part of your reality, the good and the bad. This idea is what I find really beautiful about the ending. Since the characters of the previous games have affected my life so greatly, it was absolutely incredible to see a literal representation of it. At first, I thought I may have been overthinking this, but Kadaka confirmed this idea in particular on Twitter and expressed in both an interview and another tweets more examples of how he wanted V3 to surpass the fourth wall and enter into reality. One of the most interesting examples to me is the reasoning behind revealing that every everything in the killing games was fiction. On V3's anniversary, Kadaka posted a series of spoiler tweets relating to his thoughts on the ending. He deleted them after a short amount of time of them being up, but Kamun Kotino on Tumblr screenshotted and translated these tweets. I'll link their posts with the translations below. In these tweets, he states that with Dangarapa 1 and 2, he felt that the player was sympathizing with Naegi and Hajime from an objective point of view. So with V3, he wanted us, the players, to experience the same to spare a Saihara, and thus came in the idea to make everything fiction, since he knew this would surely drag the player into despair as well. Again, this connects the idea of fiction exceeding past the fourth wall and into reality, although this was meant more so to take place 
in real time as you're playing the game. Another thing that he was trying to accomplish with this idea was that since he intended for the player to share the same despair as Saihara, he wanted us to feel as if we were shouting the final refutation alongside him, again relating back to the idea of fiction and reality fusing together and breaking the fourth wall. This was something I definitely did not catch on my first playthrough of the game, and even going back and editing didn't notice at all. I do want to say here that after making this video and really sitting down and thinking about the ending, I actually love it. I really respect Kadaka for going against the grain and trying to do something so controversial and different. And I really love the theme that the epilogue portrays as well for some of the personal reasons I mentioned before. But with this in mind, I do totally understand why there are so many out there that dislike this ending, and I respect that stance on it as well. And although I do love the ending now, I do feel as if there were some flaws in its presentation, and the portrayal of the audience within V3 is probably my biggest criticism regarding it. Kadaka states in an interview with my Navi, translated by Dangan Rompam on Tumblr, that he expected the backlash that the ending would gain, and that there would be some out there that would misinterpret it. Regarding the audience in V3, he states this, they're, aka the viewers in V3, from a completely different world. That world's viewers aren't our players. It's really popular in the world over there, in the world over here, it's not laughs. I wanted to do that kind of thing mainly due to that plot device. On Twitter, he continues on to explain that the reason the audience resembled the same opinions as many real fans of the series was because he wanted to make it realistic. He seemed to think that the player could see the disconnect from themselves and V3's audience because Danganronpa is so widely popular in that universe and is not in reality. Personally, while playing the game myself, I didn't feel that disconnect and felt as if V3's audience was intended to represent the fans of Danganronpa in the real world. I've seen many others online express that this is how they felt while playing as well, and this was one of the main aspects of the ending that I felt initially bothered by. I love the idea of fiction transcending past the fourth wall and into reality. I love the idea that fiction holds the same power as reality in many ways to affect a person, and the idea of making the player experience the same despair as Daihara and overcoming that despair together. But to me, I don't think they created enough differences between us and the audience to establish an apparent disconnect. Instead, they made way too many similarities with the focus of it appearing realistic and ended up making the ending have an opposite effect on many players, including myself. To where, instead of feeling as if the events taking place in the game had enough power to pass through the TV and affect my reality, I felt as if I was being dragged into the game and was being portrayed by the audience. Also, instead of feeling that the despair Saihara and I shared together brought us closer, I felt that the game was implying that I brought it upon him and that he was refuting me rather than us refuting the audience together. I know that this is my personal experience and that not all people who played the game felt the same as me, and I'm not trying to say that this is a flaw just because I didn't personally grasp it correctly on my first playthrough. I'm sure there are people out there that understood what Team Danganronpa and Kadaka were going for immediately, but I have seen so many people express that they felt the same way as I did on my first playthrough, both in Japan and in the West. Even the person who interviewed Kadaka with my Navi said that they thought the game was insulting them as well. This is why I personally feel that they should have established a larger disconnect between us and V3's audience. I understand that they wanted to make it realistic, but personally, I think there could have been better ways to betray the audience in a realistic light without it being such a seemingly direct reference to real-life Danganronpa fans. I think if it would have focused on emphasizing the differences between us and the audience in V3, for example, the fact that they enjoy a killing game with real people rather than us who enjoy games with fictional characters, that would have drawn much more of a disconnect for me personally, so that I could have then noticed my shared emotional connection with Saihara that was intended to be the highlight. But this is just my personal opinion, I do still really love the ending, I just wish that this idea would have been more apparent while playing the game, because it's a really cool concept. But anyways, let me know what you guys think about this down below if you have any differing opinions or anything to add on to mine. Next, I'd like to talk more about the everything being fiction reveal, since this was another aspect of the ending that I was very hesitant about at first. As with the rest of the ending, it grew on me over time, but I think the main thing I find intriguing about this part is how Shuichi implies in the epilogue that Samugi may have been lying to them in the trial about their full situation, this being that she implies that she was copying someone. This seems contradictory to some of the other statements she said, since she also mentioned 
mentioned that she had a hand in creating all 53 seasons of Danganronpa. Also, it seems strange that she would attempt to mimic the actions of Junko, someone she claims to be a fictional character. So this leads Saihara to believe that it's possible Junko really did exist, but of course there's no confirmation on that. To go along with this, he prompts you to revisit the prologue to confirm whether or not at least one of her claims is real. This being the claim that he, Kaido, and Kaide were excited in the prologue upon hearing that they were selected for the killing game. If you do decide to go back and revisit that scene, you will notice that it literally did not happen. It actually kind of freaked me out when I checked it. I guess you could argue that the creators didn't include it because they didn't want the situation to become too obvious to the player, but the fact that Saihara specifically notes that he's hesitant believing this moment implies to me that's not the case and that she truly was lying about this event happening. That or maybe she does believe it happened, but there are some inconsistencies with her memories as well, but I'll expand on that theory a bit more later in the video. Personally, I do think that Junko and the Remnants of Despair are real in this universe, and that she was lying because of the way this is worded. He implies that if she was lying about the flashback, it's likely that the Remnants of Despair and Junko did exist, and since we have the ability to go back and check the validity of that statement, to me it implies that she was in fact lying, and that this was intended to be a lead for us to follow in theory building on what we think is beyond the ending. But this is just my own personal interpretation of the lines. Let me know if you guys have any differing opinions below. I also did want to talk about how there are so many other inconsistencies with the ending and what was revealed as well. I'd like to show you guys a few that either myself or my friends pointed out to me. The first and most popular inconsistency I've seen people talk about is of course Cospox. The inconsistency with this is that she stated that all of them were fictional characters, and yet she still broke out into cospox while dressing as Kaide. In Trial 6, Samugi claims that when they arrived to the school, they were their true selves. She also claims that they agreed willingly to participate in the killing game. But in the prologue, you can notice that Kaide states that she was forcefully kidnapped and brought to the killing game, even though Samugi said they willingly volunteered for it. Along with this, in Saihara's audition tape, his name is blurred out implying that he gained a new name when he became the fictional character Saihara Shuichi, but in the prologue, both Saihara and Kaide introduce themselves by the same names that they have before even being given their ultimate talent. Going back to the prologue, one of my friends pointed out that it's also really suspicious that in the gym, nobody notices who Rontaro is since he was in the last season of Danrapa and Tsubugi claimed that they were all such big fans of the series. They also pointed out that it's odd that Samugi claims she's the mastermind and that everyone was their true self when they arrived at the school, but in the prologue, she acts as if she has no clue what's going on in the gym either. This makes no sense if she really is the mastermind because the game hadn't technically started yet, and since the Mana Cubs are planning on using the flashback lights on the students anyways, she could have just been fully honest with who she was and correct the Mana Cubs' mistakes more quickly as well. This is what sort of makes me believe that there could be some inconsistencies consistencies with her memories as well, and that possibly she was given fake memories of her being the mastermind rather than actually being the one behind this. But this is all just totally speculation on my part. I'm not really dead set on this theory since I don't have very much evidence of it. Another thing I'd like to point out in the prologue isn't really an inconsistency, but is more so something I found really weird. In the prologue, it implies that Kaide recognizes the Mana Cubs. She states, anyways, if you guys really are the Mana Cubs, then, implying that she knows who they are and is afraid of what will happen next. The last thing I want to point out in this section is a theory that isn't mine, but one I found on Reddit and thought was really interesting. The user Kaiser Beam has pointed out that in Samugi's ultimate research lab, the recording area in the back of her lab looks very similar to the backdrop that was featured in the audition tapes. This has led many people, including myself, to believe that she could have been cosplaying as them in the tapes that she showed in the sixth trial. Again, not really a whole lot of evidence behind this, it's all just speculation. And as for what I believe the true meaning behind the killing game is and what is truly going on, I really have like no idea right now. I do think there is a good chance that Samugi was lying in the trial and that Junko and the Remnants of Despair really do exist in this universe. 
mostly because of that um, prompt that you have to go back and check everything. Eventually, I really would like to make a video going over um, theory building on the ending, but for right now, it really just makes my brain hurt. I really sat down and looked very diligently through the final trial and the prologue and felt there wasn't really one solid theory I could dedicate myself to because a lot of it just depends on what Smoogie was or wasn't telling the truth about. And with all the outlandish lies and theatrics we saw throughout the killing game, you can really argue either way that she's lying or telling the truth on pretty much anything. I also think this is intentional and that nothing truly solid can be deduced from the inconsistencies we see throughout the game as well. Regarding this, Kadaka states, in the end, this all ties to the theme of the series as a whole. The reason why I didn't show the outside world in Dangarpa 1 was because hope and despair don't exist in the outside. They are defined inside of your head. So are truth and lies. So are fiction and reality. What is truth and what are lies? What is reality and what is fiction? Your minds decide whether or not you think you were deceived. This line here is what makes me believe that there really isn't a solid theory that anyone can make. It seems as if Kadaka wants each person to come to their own conclusion and for the mystery of the outside world to stay intact. In conclusion, I really do actually love the ending, to my own shock. It grew on me over time, and I feel like I've come to appreciate what Kadaka and the team were trying to do with it. I am a bit frustrated with how they portrayed the audience, and really feel that should have been handled better. I really do love the idea of us and Saihara coming together at the end, and would have really loved to experience that while playing the game, but unfortunately just could not make that connection. Initially, I was pretty frustrated that the end portrayed the possibility of everything being fiction as well well, but now looking back I realize that it's just a possibility and as Kadaka stated in that tweet, it's up to us to decide if we were deceived or not. I know a lot of people hate this idea, but for a game that is based on the theme of truth versus lies, it's a pretty ingenious way to end things with us not knowing by the end what was truth and what was fiction, at least in my opinion. I just really like that concept personally, and as I said before, I love how much they emphasize the power fiction has to affect reality as well, since it personally has had a big effect on my life and many of my friends lives too. But anyways, I do hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think about the ending and if you have any theories regarding the end as well. Because like I said before, I really had a hard time coming up with any theories that I felt very strongly about, but I would like to eventually make a video maybe just covering a bunch of theories about the ending or trying to finally find one that I really like. For the next video, I'll probably end up doing like a top list. Uh, I've seen a lot of people want me to do like top lists for V3, like top executions or top ships. So I'll probably do something like that next. I know a lot of you guys are really interested in me doing an OMA analysis, and believe me, I am too. But um, I do think I want to do a character analysis of Karekio first, just to try to help me get back in the swing of things. But um, the OMA analysis will be coming fairly soon, so I hope you guys will look forward to that. But anyways, I hope you guys did enjoy this video, and I will see you real soon. Subscribe to Weeby News for more hope-filled videos.